So Whip Smart is about my three or four year experience as a professional dominatrix and heroin addict. Didn't know there were professional heroin addicts, did you? Um, <laughs> no, I was an amateur, but I was a professional dominatrix. And um, do you guys know what a dominatrix is? You can ask Kate afterwards if you don't. <laughs> this is from somewhere sort of in the middle of the experience um, when I've been doing it for a little while. And I was in my, I was like around 20 or 21. I'd never liked parties. Even as a child, I tended to form intense one-on-one -on -one relationships rather than groups of friends. Unless there was dancing, I didn't see the point of hanging out in a large group, which made it impossible to connect with any single person and triggered a shyness that I liked to hide. I also typically wanted to get so high that public locations were impractical. <laughs> At a party, I might have to share my drugs or talk to someone who'd care that I'd forgotten how my legs worked. After a few months of working at the dungeon, however, my interest in social events spiked. I now had the power to hijack any conversation, to commandeer the attention of however many people were within earshot at any given moment. As far as I could tell, no one was immune to the curiosity that the phrase, I'm a professional dominatrix, provoked. <laughs> I lulled happily in the silence that followed uttering it, knowing the torrent of questions that would follow, the shine of eyes that suddenly saw me new. Knowing that I was likely the sole spokesperson for a subculture most people would never experience imbued me with a confidence that I otherwise lacked. I was the reigning expert, the beautiful geek, and I loved their shock at how normal I seemed, how unlike what they would have imagined. With this ace in my pocket, parties became fun. Whether I pulled it out or not, I still had its power and took comfort in worrying it like a lucky stone. On Halloween, Rebecca and I went to a party in Dumbo where I was supposed to meet a date. With a vial of cocaine, three bags of heroin, and a disposable syringe folded in a sock tucked in the inside pocket of my purse, I convinced my roommate to take a cab and had her laughing the whole way there. The giddiness of anticipation always made me funny. I had her in stitches with my description of Jean, the sweater man, who brought a duffel bag to the dungeon every week full of knitted clothing. He liked to be completely swathed in sweaters. Sweater socks, sweater underpants, sweater mittens, sweater hats, sweater trousers, sweater masks. When he had nary an inch of naked skin bared, I would immobilize him with rope bondage. That really was it. He liked to be tickled sometimes while bound and sweater mummified, but really just being sweaty, sweatered, and bound was enough for Jean. I could just hang out in the room while he gently writhed and cooed in his fuzzy cocoon. Jean made for an ideal anecdote, ridiculous and benign. I also wanted to distract Rebecca from any nervousness I might exhibit in omitting the fact that I had a purse full of drugs. I'd become more comfortable omitting things from her, though I suspected she knew more than I told her. We both felt the distance that my lies created, and with increasing frequency, I catch her looking at me with worried eyes. I'm not sure I'd ever known a feeling more invincible than walking into a party feeling beautiful with drugs in my purse and a secret life that everyone was dying to know about. I've seen the girls who feel like this walking into rooms. Sometimes beauty is enough. They are irresistible. One can't help looking at them with their smooth hair and self-conscious hands, their eyes bright with secret joy. But they are so delicate in their preening and their need. And I fear for them now, knowing what they might do to keep that joy from trickling out of them, as it always does. I'm going to stop there. I'll spare you my other clients and just leave you with the sweater man. Um, but there's lots of gory details if you're interested. Um, so I'm going to read, this is from a new, a new book that I'm working on, um, that I guess is also a memoir, but it's sort of pulling threads from a few different places, um, and it's written in, I'm trying to think of a good alternative for vignettes, but, so I'm going to say it's very small chapters, um, so I'll try to pause so you can see where they, where they stop, but, um, but sort of the meatiest thread of this story is um, me, I guess it's not reuniting, but sort of meeting my biological father for the first time and his family and sort of investigating that, that. Whale watch. Every school year, every kid on Cape Cod spends one afternoon on the deck of a boat watching for whales. Sometimes we never saw one. We knew they were there, but the afternoons were not long enough or they were too long, and our patients thin and young, the sky heavy and leaking gray tears. We grew bored, flopping like fish on the deck, antagonizing each other, impulses pinballing through our little bodies. But when we saw one, 
the shining black thick of it, the fat stripe of hot-blooded sea monster, the awesome spit of breath, and the terrible mystery of what stayed beneath the surface. In the grace of that glimpse, everything went quiet. The hush of knowing what we could not yet name might never. Our lives torn loose from the fabric of human understanding, the mirror of everything wild in the world. First visit. The drive from Brooklyn to Vernon, Connecticut takes three hours. Three hours and 30 years. I plan to buy flowers once there rather than having them wilt in the car. Really, I suspect I will need the time to stall, to find my feet in this strange town and the impulse that brought me here, to wait for its cresting, touch its slick back, to feel the pull. When I woke this morning drenched in sweat and shivering, I felt nothing. The first leg of the trip is along Route 95, the same I take to Massachusetts to see my mother. Gliding down the freeway, I turn up the stereo's volume, my finger tapping across the radio keys, spelling out my need for sound. I fill the car with the soaring pop of today. I beat the heel of my palm against the steering wheel to the pulse of these love songs, their simple cries of want and wish and worship. My phone chimes from the passenger seat, echoed by a bell in me, a clang in my chest that is all I want to feel this morning. It is my lover, the poet. Her touch firing across the 2,500 miles between us, ringing that bell. Only she knows where I'm going today. And it is her hands, I imagine, cupping my buzzing body, carrying me softly outside, releasing me like a caught bee. After Stamford, the city seeps out of the landscape. Hamden, Middlefield, Wethersfield, Meriden, Robertson, towns inhabited by people who have never been to New York or once as children. On a smaller highway, the road empties, its surface bleached, pitted with potholes. I switch lanes, switch radio stations, notice my palms wet on the wheel. When I see the signs for Vernon, I slow. At an intersection, I park outside a strip of shops and open a smudged glass door that reads pharmacy. A bell rings. A round woman glances up from the counter. There are no shoppers, no music, and I can taste the dust that drifts through the raft of sunlight. I feel underwater, as if I've stepped out of time and into this stranger's living room. I should blink and find myself somewhere recognizable. Instead, she and I blink at each other. I know immediately that I want nothing here, but I ask her where the greeting cards are. Hallmark makes no card for this occasion. I owe no thank you, no love, no condolences, get well soon, unlikely. I buy one with a puppy on the cover and a blank inside. I ask where I can buy flowers. The woman stares at me, her gaze plodding through the dust-laden air between us until it meets my question. Real flowers, she asks. Vernon is a former cotton mill town, but the last mill was torn down in 39, and the town never stood up again. It has the grim set of all such towns, reminds me of the Rust Belt city where I taught for one year, all ramshackle Victorians set into hillsides, yellow signs, and barren streets. Pawn and tobacco shops with a few ghosted stairs from inside, endless salt and ice-crusted winters, gas station coffee drinkers, the few faces leaning over the lotto counter white and textured by smoke and sorrow. People with bodies slanted like they've been walking against this wind their whole lives because they have. The house is at the end of a road that dead ends into another. At the cross of this T, it sits, stout and gray, wearing a disheveled skirt of porch. I glide toward it, turning off the radio, wiping my hands on my thighs, one at a time. As I turn into the driveway, a man steps out onto the porch. I glide toward it, him, turning, oops, sorry. The car moves forward, but inside I dig my heels. When I cut the engine, something pours into the stillness. Maybe it pours out of me. I know it. The thick texture of this silence, of stopping, even as a little girl, I preferred the rumble of forward motion, the world sliding by, a film of color and light trapped behind glass. I hated arriving. When the engine's pulse died, something died in me too, or woke. Hands on the wheel, I close my eyes and inhale, the seatbelt pressing against my chest, a small hand whose comfort I accept. Please let him not leave that porch. When I open my eyes, he's on the other side of my door. I smile tight and unclasp the seatbelt. There is nowhere to go but out. I have been imagining his face for days, but now I cannot look at him, not while he is looking at me. 
I gather the flowers in my purse from the passenger seat. He is so close to my door that I have to wave him back before opening it. He is a man with the face of a child. No, not the face, the face behind the face. Behind his glasses, his eyes grasp at me. I open the door and step onto the leaf papered ground into the cold afternoon and I face him. Who knows what we say? I initiate the hug though we barely touch. My face so near his stubbled cheek, I can feel him shake, smell aftershave and alcohol. We stand in the leaves. He doesn't lead me into the house until I gesture toward it, and I follow him through the back door, the yellowed pantry, into the kitchen. Two women sit at a folding table, and he steps back, presenting me. I hand the flowers to the younger woman who looks like him. Her hands shake, too, as she takes the flowers. Thank you, she says, and then to the older woman who is very old. Look, real flowers. <laughs> The old woman stares, unhearing, at the flowers, at me, at him. This is Melissa, he announces. What? She says, squinting, smacking her gums. She has no front teeth, leans her forearms on a folded crossword puzzle. This is Melissa, he shouts. She stares, hearing, but not comprehending. Nancy's daughter, he adds. She tilts her head, understanding, slowly filtering across her face. Her eyes focus on me and then shift to him. Then she's your daughter too, she exclaims, suddenly grinning, tongue tucked in the space where her front teeth should be. Yes, he nods. 